Welcome back officially to the PS3 era. <laughs> I know I played the last ones on the PS3, but there's still PS2 games. Now we are officially in HD. For better or worse. <laughs> um, we shall see. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, you probably didn't watch the first part of this where I went over the PS2 Ratchet and Clank games. Um, now, as the title says, we are on to PS3, which includes Ratchet and Clank Future. Tools of Destruction. I was like reading it in my camera view, even though I know the title. Whatever. Um, as well as A Crack in Time, which I have digitally. Um, a Quest for Booty, which is digital only. And Ratchet and Clank Into the Nexus, uh, which is the chronologically last game in the series until the new one comes out. Uh, so yeah. We have three and a half games to get into this time, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time with the rigmarole up front. That is a fun word. Rigmarole. I'm already wasting time. I lied to you. Like I said, we are going to first up be playing Ratchet & Clank Future Tools of Destruction. Um, it is the first Ratchet & Clank game on the PS3, and I think it shows. Um, but I will save full review for that section. I hope you enjoy my thoughts on these PS3 era of games. I've been told they get real good, so this should be an interesting experiment. <laughs> Let's just jump right into it with Tools of Destruction. I'm going to say the title again. Why not? Okay, so, first official PS3 game. I mean, <laughs> it's a generational upgrade, that's for sure. I don't know if that's always a good thing, but um, let's just go down some kind of pros and cons here. Um, I took a lot more notes this time than I did in the last trilogy. I'm hope Hopefully my thoughts will be a little bit more organized, but it's me we're talking about. We'll see. Um, so the first thing I noticed was that the game is... It's a lot more detailed and cinematic. Um, I mean, clearly, you know, it's like I said, it's a generational upgrade. The graphics are better. Uh, the environments have more going on. It, it looks great. Um, but it's also, like, weirdly fuzzy. Uh, the game is running at 720p because it's a PS3 game. But I think because, like, the PS2 trilogy was kind of that crisp, like lower poly but like vibrantly colored art style like up that to 720 made it look a lot nicer and cleaner than this does naturally you know on the hardware it's being developed for and so some of those graphics don't quite come across as well because it's just it's trying to dump so much on screen that like there was a lot more noticeable like pop in of textures and things like that and like weird kind of like visual glitches just a lot of glitches in general honestly but we'll <laughs> we'll talk about that more later um and like i had a harder time telling like what things were important because ratchet kind of blended into the environment and so did the enemies so like i would get hit and there wasn't a lot of tactile feedback to realize that i was getting hit so i'd die without even knowing that i was losing health with, with all the stuff happening on screen it, it it can get easy to lose track of the moment and everything's a little bit darker and kind of more like smoothed out so like the characters and the enemies don't pop as much 
as they did before when there was less going on. Um, this is actually something I, uh, it's a problem I have with a lot of PS3 games. Like with God of War 3, for example, I have never beaten that one because like, I don't know, there's something about like, it's it's clearly a very pretty like cinematic game, but the, the presentation of everything really is just a lot more like subtle, I guess. Like it's a little more zoomed out. The, uh, the the fixed camera actually runs into some issues every now and then. Like, for the most part, you have control of the camera. But whenever it goes to a fixed camera view, there's so much happening and you have so little control over, like, what you're seeing, it can be fairly easy to, uh, to make mistakes or, like, not notice where your character is at the moment. That kind of thing. Like, the, the issues that I had more with, like, PS1 games where it was, like, kind of the static like hand-drawn backgrounds with the, you know, the sprites or the 3D models moving around in that space. Like it wasn't always clear where you were going. It's kind of that same problem, but like fully in 3D, which is kind of weird when you think about it. Um, I don't know. There's something about like the PS2 game aesthetic that just worked more for me for these kind of like platformer action games than the PS3 aesthetic. And maybe they're finding their footing still. Like, the future game... <laughs> future games. They're all the future games. Um, the, the later games in on the PS3 might have a bit more of a stylized art style. Yeah. Uh, I don't know yet. But this one was a little muddied. Um, even though it looked great still. But I spent a lot of time on that. Sorry. Um, I love that you start with a lot of the basics already acquired. So, like, the opening section is pretty great. Um, it's very fast-paced. It quickly takes you through, like, the basics of movement and gunplay and all that. Um, it shows you, like, the grind boots, the swing shot. Like, all of that stuff you have from the start. And it really just drops you right into the new stuff a lot quicker. And I was a big fan of that. Also, the new enemies in this game are pretty fun. Um, it's... I got kind of tired of all the robots in the PS2 games. For the most part, these are still robots, but it's really satisfying to kill them. And, like, a little fish just plops down on, on the ground and starts flopping around. Like, there's something about that. That, like, there, there's a lot more of kind of the physics effects and things like that in this one that I enjoyed quite a bit. And the enemies had a lot more personality because, like, there was more variety of them. Um, like, pretty much each world had its own enemy type at least one but also like their death animations and things like that were a lot more dynamic and cool uh, what's less funny are the six axis six axis motion gimmicks that's kind of a hard thing to say six axis motion gimmicks i guess it's not that hard yeah there's quite a few of them and none of them are really that good the first thing you have to do is like they're, they're kind of the the drop missions like from up your arsenal but instead of just being able to move around, you have to, for some reason, use the motion to move Ratchet on the way down. And, like, there's no reason for it. It's something that worked and wasn't even that great before, and they made it worse with the motion. And then one of the first new weapons you get is, a like, a tornado gun that you manipulate the movement for it using the six axis. So in the middle of combat, you're expected to throw out a tornado and like wiggle your controller around it's awful i i never like i didn't touch that weapon because it's so bad <laughs> um like pretty much every other weapon i upgraded at least almost done by the end but man i couldn't do it i hated that weapon um none of the others used motion gimmicks either it was just that one i don't know if they wanted one weapon to like show off the the six axis but oof not good uh, the worst, uh, yeah, I'll say, the worst defender, just because it was, like, totally unnecessary, was a new gadget that, like, basically lasers faults into walls to create, like, holes, like, kind of shortcut holes. Not only was the gadget pretty much unnecessary, in, in past games you just threw a, a bomb or whatever and destroyed the walls that way, but this one had you, like awkwardly moving around this laser with your controller like trying to go like point to point um like a connect the dots game and then you get to the end and it explodes and there was rarely like it was usually just a alternate passage so they didn't need to do that but whatever 
And finally, on the note of things they didn't need to do, there's a new door unlock gadget. And this one also uses six axis, six axis motion gimmicks. If you were a big fan of those Marvel, well, marble moving games in uh, Breath of the Wild, like the, the shrines where you had to do the, the move the marble around and get to the, the other side, you might like these, <laughs> but oof. So yeah, basically you are tilting a table uh, to move a ball around that connects like different like electrical nodes so that the electricity isn't broken on its path to the like electrical outlet or whatever to energize the door. It's never that hard. The hardest part is like just swinging the controller to try and get the ball to the next point you need. Um, but the actual like puzzles themselves are never really that hard. Uh, it did get a little bit better when I found out that you can hold the uh, cross button, X, to like stabilize the ball so that even if you know you have like micro movements or whatever with your hands um the ball doesn't move from a spot but still like when you let go of that it starts swinging in the direction that your controller was so you have to like kind of prep it again or you know overcompensate for the movement to try and swing it around to the next spot and then hold it there again so yeah this was not fun and really I could have done without any of the six axis stuff. Um, I didn't look if there was like an accessibility thing that lets you use all of them with uh, with the stick instead. Probably not, because this was early PS3 and they really wanted to sell everyone on the six axis. But I hate it. I hate everything about it. Oh, and there's one more too. The, the glider from the past games where you basically like just kind of, you know, did like a swoop um, and could just kind of keep moving downward. They retooled it in this, and actually it's really cool because it kind of does what I was talking about before, where it combines the jetpack and the glider into one gadget. But that one gadget is motion controlled. So you have to tilt the controller around to go various directions, and then you can also like hit cross, I think, to flap upward to get more height. But everything else is motion. And it's real bad. Um, not only that, but like a lot of these level or a lot of these worlds are quite a bit bigger and more involved. And in a few cases, you have like free reign of the whole planet with the glider. So you're trying to figure out which path to go. So you're like constantly switching over to the map because there's no mini map or anything, even though these levels are bigger. Um, you're constantly switching over to the map to like get your bearings and then switching back, you know, motion control, check your map. Like it gets real tedious. And you don't have to do it that often, but, like, they almost nailed it. <laughs> this gadget was exactly what I was wanting from the last ones, but they still managed to screw it up, and that's a bummer. And also, because the levels are so much bigger, which for the most part is a good thing, like, you spend a lot more time on each planet rather than, you know, jumping, jumping, jumping. There's still a lot of them, <laughs> but you actually backtrack to a few at certain points, and, like, the worlds are bigger, so you spend more time on them. Like, I liked the progression for the most part. But these larger worlds require a lot of movement. And the movement speed seems, at best, as fast as it was in past games. At worst, slower. And you don't get any kind of, like, dash move or anything like you've had before that would help you traverse some of those bigger areas. So it just feels like it takes forever to get places sometimes. But what they didn't screw up were the new uh, Clank solo missions. Um, they were actually quite a bit of fun. I, I like the story stuff in general, which I'll get to in a little bit. But the the whole idea of like Clank being in touch with these uh, Zony creatures and them kind of replacing the like Gadgetbots or whatever from the past games was really cool to me because they had a little bit more ability to them. And, like, they auto-attacked, which was huge, because it was so annoying to, like, make sure you were kind of lined up correctly and then, like, toggle up to attack and then they run out and kill. Like, here they just kind of pew-pew on their own and you can just move around and do whatever. Um, and then there's, like, an ongoing levitate ability that Clint can use to cross, like, larger gaps and stuff. And then some context-sensitive options, like... 
uh, there's like a manipulate or something that it's called that just like builds something or like transforms stuff around you into something else. Um, and then there's another one that just energizes doors and things like those kind of same concepts are here, but I just think these puzzle, these sections are a lot more fun. And it's one area where I definitely, I see some of the, uh, the next gen stuff at work, uh, with some more creative clank stuff. Also better than the past games are the ship missions. Uh, they're back, but they're not really back. They're kind of a new thing. Um, it feels almost like like Star Fox or the gummy ship missions in uh, Kingdom Hearts, where like you're kind of on rails, and you can move your ship like around the the static screen as you know you just kind of naturally move forward, um, and you move the ship and the aiming reticle separately with left and right sticks. But yeah, I mean, like it's it's pretty satisfying because of the on rails thing. You're not constantly like running into op into obstacles and like you know messing around with a terrible camera and all that stuff. You're really just focusing on aiming at enemies as they, as they show up. Uh, there's occasional kind of like obstacle course sections where you're like dodging and weaving through uh, through different gaps and stuff. And there's hidden collectibles that you can shoot. Um, I don't really, I think they just get you a titanium bolt in the end, but it's still kind of just kind of a cool, like, extra thing. You know, if you notice them, you can shoot them and, and get a little bonus at the end. There's some pretty neat bosses that admittedly don't have a lot of variety, but at least, like, require you to kind of time your movements and stuff to not get, to not take damage. And speaking of, you can do the thing. Do a barrel roll! That's right, you can barrel roll. That's always a good time. The barrel roll doesn't feel great, but you can do it. That's the point. So yeah, th these sections are fairly harmless. Like, I wouldn't choose to do more of them than what are in the game. Um, they definitely don't overstay their welcome, but they're enjoyable. Like, this is one of those things where I feel like they knew exactly how satisfying this gameplay was and put in that amount of them to do. No more, no less. Also, most of the weapons aren't great. I know I'm I'm saying more cons than pros, and I'm sorry. I I am not as invested in this PS3 trilogy as I was the PS2 trilogy so far. Um, but the weapons aren't great. Uh, they feel functional, like there's, you know, a an aimed just like pew pew machine gun type thing that you have in every game. I think it's even called the combustor. Um, which I think was from past games. There's like a, you know, a, a ball bomb like that you lob. There's a, a melee whip sword type thing. There's a circular saw blade. What, what is that thing called? I couldn't remember what it was called in past games either. It's a circular saw blade, saw blade weapon that just, you know, sends out saw blades over and over again. Like, they're basically the same as what's been in past games. There's a few new ones that are pretty decent, but they still feel functional to last ones. Um, and the new things in this game are the devices. So there's, you know, there's weapons that can be upgraded. Um, there's still five levels of upgrades. There's gadgets, which can't be upgraded, but you use in puzzles and stuff. And then there's devices, which act sort of like weapons, but only you can only have a few of each one, and they don't upgrade or anything. So this was actually the first appearance of Mr. Zircon, and he is a device in this game. And there's a few other ones that are really cool, like there's uh, a few that will leech life from enemies. Um, and I found that really useful in some of the bigger firefights. Because you could, like, when you start to get low and, like, you've taken out all of the uh, the life boxes around you, you can throw that thing out, do damage to the enemies, and take some back. It never really, like, saved the day because you don't get a lot back, but, like, it would help me survive a little bit longer. But for the most part, like, these aren't amazing. Like, there's the Groovatron Ball, which I never used. There was a, a new, like, transformation thing and the, the Penguinator, I think it's called. Never used it. Um, I just, I didn't feel a lot of need to use these things when they don't upgrade or anything. Um, so like I threw out a Mr. Zircon just when I needed some extra help. Um, and then I used the leech, 
seed things, <laughs> leech seed, that's a Pokemon, to, to give me more life, but the others didn't really feel necessary. But it's cool that they're there. Um, I just, I like in later games when they are actual weapons instead that can be upgraded. Um, but yeah, the upgrade system is nice, but somewhat forgettable. Um, each weapon, like I said, has five levels of upgrades before it like maxes out and becomes a different weapon. But this is also the first game that introduces like the uh, the upgrade tree, where you use raritanium to put points into various upgrades for the weapons, like um, more ammo, more power, things like that. Um, so the actual like upgrading each weapon felt very satisfying, and there was fewer of them, so you felt more invested in each weapon. But I just didn't really care for the weapons themselves. Like I liked the system. And I'm pretty sure that keeps going, so I think I'm going to enjoy future games where maybe there's a better, you know, weapon variety. But a lot of these I felt like I was just using because I didn't have them maxed out yet. Like, I didn't really have a favorite of the bunch that I wanted to keep using. Um, it's just whenever I maxed one out, I'd shelve it, unless I was, you know, out of ammo and everything else. And then I'd move on to the next one I needed to max out. That was pretty much it. I don't even remember a lot of them, honestly. The one I did like was like a like a Lombax secret weapon. And it was kind of this game's sniper rifle, but you have to actually like charge it up and it does crazy amounts of damage. Like you take out most enemies in one hit. And that thing was pretty satisfying, but it also took a while to charge. But yeah, weapons weren't great. Um, and like the tornado launcher, some were just bad. <laughs> I want to talk about the final boss, but before I do that, I want to hear from our sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. No, I'm kidding. Um, I want to talk about the story in general. So I was actually pretty invested in the story on this one. Um, this is the first one that really, like, it feels like it's telling a, a larger, like, expansive universe story that will clearly continue into future games. Um, whereas the other, like, the last trilogy, I thought it was going to continue, and then the next one kind of just threw everything out the window and did its own thing. But this one, like, it delves a lot more into, like, the history of the Lombax and, like, this this weird ancient war that nearly, like, it basically made the Lombax endangered um, and also, like, killed the Kragmites, I think they're called. So it was, like, the, the Lombax-Kragmite war um, that somehow Ratchet had never heard of before this game, but whatever. Um, so this this legendary emperor, uh, Emperor Tachyon, who is like the, the leader of the Kragmites, crashes in and just ruins Ratchet's day, leaving him stranded without a ship or anything. It's actually a really cool section. Like the first part of the game is just basically Ratchet and Clank like on the run, trying to like figure out what's going on, um, find out who this Tachyon guy is, where their ship is, how they can get back home, like, you know, how... How does this guy know about Lombaxes? Like, Ratchet doesn't even know anything about the Lombaxes, and he is one. Um, so there's a lot of really cool, like, questions it asks in the beginning. And there's some interesting new supporting cast members and things like that. But it does pretty quickly devolve into, you know, go to the next world, grab the thing, then go to the next world, take that thing there. Um, in this case, it's, it's the Dimensionator, which could... Uh, I don't really know what the plan with it was, actually. I think it was just, like, opening up the to the dimension of the Kragmites to, like, bring them back and finally rid the world of the Lombaxes. I don't know. Tachyon has major beef with with, with Ratchet, is the point. And it's like that uh, in-game meme where, where Tachyon's like, you took everything from me, and Ratchet's like, I don't even know who you are. <laughs> But yeah, there was some cool stuff there, and it was way deeper than anything that the PS2 did. But I, I generally have an issue with these games because I turn captions on. For some reason, like, the captions are only on during, like, the actual, like, cinematic cutscenes, not during gameplay. So, like, a lot of story details and stuff I miss because I don't really have my sound up. So I'm not, like, hearing what they're saying. I read everything. So I missed some of the points toward the end. That's why I'm not totally sure what the plan was. But Tachyon as a, as a bad guy was pretty cool. I also, like I said, I like where it was going with Clank, where he was like, 
hearing these weird voices and like Ratchet didn't believe Clank's craziness. Even though like he's a robot, he can't go crazy. Like, trust the robot, bro. <laughs> and it like it caused this this rift between them. They were, you know, rift apart, if you will. And so like the game ends with like Ratchet and Clank like separated. Not because of the rift. They're they're separated by other things, but they're at odds for a lot of the th a lot of the time and they barely like make up and then they're torn apart again you thought i was gonna make another rift apart joke jokes on you but all of that story build up was really cool and then the final fight was kind of lame um it didn't feel like it played to the strength of this game's weapons at all like there was a there was two phases to it like i would i kept running out of ammo on everything before I finished and like there's so many weapons that are like closer range or you know um support weapons that like this kind of just bullet sponge enemy didn't really work for me because it felt like it needed to take more ammo than you had available yeah I don't know it, it something with like the development of the game or sorry the de development of like the the plot and the uh, boss fights and the development of the weapons feel like they didn't go hand in hand. Um, there were a few cool boss fights in general in the game, but the final boss fight, not so good. Yeah, it's it's kind of hard to talk about this one because like I did enjoy playing it. Like this new generation of Ratchet and Clank games, I think it's going to be really solid. But this first one is a is a rough first showing. Um, the engine is pretty glitchy. I had multiple times where, like, I would break some boxes and the rest would just be floating in the air. So it'd be really hard to reach them to break them too. Or just, like, cutscenes would kind of glitch out in weird ways. Um, the upgrade screen was constantly glitchy. Like, just kind of visual tearing type stuff. Yeah, I don't know. It, it was mostly little stuff, but, like, the... The polish on it felt less than stellar for what I would expect from Insomniac. That's all. And the game itself was a little repetitive. Um, like I said, I wasn't a big fan of most of the weapons. And there were so many sections that were just like defend the zone style missions. Where the, the people around you, like your supporting party of like Talwin and the two bumbling robot like old people robots that were kind of weird um had to like reach these terminals or whatever and so you just have to fight waves and waves of enemies that were in this big kind of open battlefield area eventually the enemies would stop and they'd move forward and do the thing like especially late in the game like on the final planet when that's one of the last things you have to do is just uh you know defend the zone and then you move forward and you're pretty much at the final battle like some of that stuff felt pretty rough and really there weren't a lot of memorable puzzles either like i said it was great that you get the grind boots and the the mag boots and stuff like that so early but then they don't do a lot with them like it's not bad it just, it's very by the numbers. This whole game feels by the numbers. It's like they had three games, they got the Ratchet and Clank formula, and that's it. Just, just make another one. And that's strange to me, because I remember this series so fondly, I loved it. And like, that's why I can't say it's bad or anything. Like, it's perfectly serviceable as another Ratchet and Clank game. <laughs> but really, the new things it does kind of suck like most most of it's six axis stuff um and the things it just pulls from past games are all just copies really like it doesn't do any of them exceptionally well or in a way that's like man i hope that's the way it is from here on out it's all just kind of there it's a good game but on the tier of like ratchet and clank games it's fine. <laughs> but speaking of fine, let's move on to the digital follow-up to this game, Ratchet & Clank Future Quest for Booty. Should I do that in a pirate accent? Quest for Booty. 
I don't do accents. Just roll the clip. Okay, so I'm just honestly going to get it out up front here. Uh, this game is unnecessary. <laughs> it doesn't do anything better or worse than what the last game did. It also doesn't do anything terribly new or interesting with the formula, and it's extremely short. Yeah, so s this review is also going to be short. <laughs> Uh, the one thing I like about this game is the style of it all. Like, it has some really cool stylized uh, cutscene sections that play out like a storybook. Um, like, it starts with kind of a stylized recap of the last game to set up the scene for what for where this game starts. But as soon as it gets into actual gameplay, you notice it's pretty much all reused assets, and it makes this really feel like a like a quick cash in flip, which I'm sure it was. But also it came out like a year after Tools of Destruction. So I mean, they had time to do a little bit more than this. But yeah, this game is just Ratchet. And boy, I miss Clank. Like the platforming is way less fun with only Ratchet. Um, he has his double jump, but so many things, like they go out of their way to like find ways to kind of get Ratchet around. And none of them feel terribly good. Uh, like, he he has a strange new ability, which I don't know how he got this new ability, but he has this new ability to uh, grab on to certain, like, uh, wrench spots and manipulate them using his wrench, obviously. So he can, like, pull down these, like, spring coil things to jump high or um, move, like, platforms around to make it so he can jump better. It's all good in theory, but it's also pretty slow. And just the act of like having to go into your aim, point it at the thing, hit the rat, hit the ratchet button, hit the wrench button, and then like, you know, pull it wherever you're, it's just, it's very slow, but it's also just, it's kind of finicky. Like it's the kind of thing that I think if it was just, you know, it auto targets and you throw the wrench out and then like, pull and it's pretty quick it would have been good but they turned it into like more of a like a full control gimmick and that didn't work for me but on that note because of these kinds of things the game is surprisingly more puzzle platforming focused it's kind of refreshing but aside from just the reliance on the new wrench gimmicks there's also kind of some some clunky uh grind boot sections where that camera that i was talking about in the last game really gets in the way there's multiple points when like i had to switch rails or um break a wall and then immediately jump and hit a swing shot and like you can't see that stuff with how the camera is so you end up doing some trial and error of just like well guess i'll die and then figure it out next time i mean you're never taken that far back but it's just it's the principle of the matter but there are some super visually interesting like mag boot sections uh, that feel like almost ripped out of like Mario Galaxy, and that's really cool. Um, unfortunately, they also rely a little bit too much on the wrench gimmicks, but they're neat, especially early on, because it's a good hour or so before you really get your weapons. Um, granted, I took my time, but you have to like activate these wind turbines around the island, and you do all of that sans weapons, so it's almost entirely like a puzzle platforming section. And I kind of liked it, actually. Like, it was a strong start for the game because it felt different from the others. I was honestly kind of wondering if they were going to give me weapons. And then they did, but it wasn't any new ones. 
It's basically like a hodgepodge of the most popular weapon. I don't want to say the best weapons because really most of them suck. Plus they give you the tornado launcher, which is just like a slap in the face. But it's probably the most functional weapons from the last game. And you get them all at level 3. So they still max out at level 5, but like basically you have two levels of upgrades for them. Um, if that's an indication of how fast this game is over. I will say um, it focuses a lot more on the pirates, which, you know, surprise, surprise, it's called Quest for Booty. And the I didn't really mention the pirates in the last game because I honestly kind of forgot about them. Um, but they were interesting. Like, they were kind of a, a side story in it all that wasn't super necessary for the plot. It was kind of just like this group that would come along every now and then and foil your plans. But they had some cool uh, set pieces and stuff. In this one, though, it's pretty much entirely about the pirates. And, I mean, the story is dumb, but, like, I really enjoy Rusty Pete. <laughs> he's a fun character. Like, he narrates the whole thing, and he's also just a hoot. Um, his whole goal is to uh, reincarnate his former captain. And so he somehow manages to trick Ratchet into taking him along on whatever plan Ratchet is doing to try and track down Clank. And basically, like, just point blank says, Sure, you've never been able to trust anything I've said before, but now you can. And then, like, ten minutes later, betrays Ratchet. Like, it's so obvious. I wouldn't have gone with him. But, you know, for plot reasons, you have to. <laughs> and at least they play it for laughs, but it's still... It's not good. Like, the story isn't, isn't good. Yeah, you get some of your weapons back and it immediately just becomes a whole game of defend the zone again <laughs> like these wisps of like ghost pirates come at you and you have to just keep fighting them until they don't show up anymore and then the sky is clear and you can move on to the next objective and every story beat basically you get a new handful of weapons that are all at level three and then before you know it it's at the end of the game um it's a lot of samey environments like you jump back and forth between only a few different places and they look exactly like the stuff did in the last game so just having finished that one like this was over in a few hours and i have a hard time differentiating what happened in this versus what happened in the in the last game um because there's no new weapons the environments all look the same like the pirate ships and the you know grassland cave like pretty generic environments it's short it's really just utterly forgettable and unnecessary to play. Um, I'm also pretty sure I broke the game during the final boss. I didn't know what to do next because he'd gone away. Like, I, I took his health down to a certain point and then he went away. And so I ran around and I found Talwin, like, locked away. Went to talk to her. She made a hint about, like, needing a skull head or something. So I was, you know, wandering around trying to find that. Went back to the ship, initiated some dialogue, and then it just, like quick cut back to like a, a close-up scene of her stuck and like it the the game wasn't frozen or anything like it was showing her idle animations and stuff but like none of the buttons worked and i had to just quit out and i'm sure it auto saved fairly recently but like i didn't feel like reloading the game like i get the idea <laughs> And I know where the story goes. You basically get a little bit of info from the the treasure map or whatever that you find uh, about where to find Clank and a tease about like what the zonies are up to. And then it ends. Like, I really I don't want to spend any more time on this game, so I don't care. <laughs> I know this is now two that I technically haven't finished, but this one wasn't my fault. That was dumb. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to fight a broken game. So let's just move on, because this one was kind of rough. And I'm excited for what's next. I've heard A Crack in Time is really good, and it's the one of all of these I haven't even touched. Into the Nexus I didn't play a lot of, but like, Crack in Time I had to literally buy for this review. Never played it. So I'm excited. Let's do this.
and we're back with a crack in time um it's honestly been a little bit since i recorded the last part for this and it's actually even been a little bit since i uh beat this game i've been a little um busy to get these recorded which sucks because i wanted to get this whole thing out by the time rift apart came out we'll see how that goes anyway this game is awesome uh, i'm gonna have to stick a little bit closer to my notes this time around because i just i don't remember every detail um, i'm already you know well into the next game by the time i record this so bear with me but let's jump right into it because i love this one it's probably the best ratchet and clan game so we're just kind of gonna go in chronological order here because that's how my notes are <laughs> but the game starts very strong uh, you can tell that they've already upped like the the cinematic quality of everything. Like the cutscenes look like they were done by a completely different like movie studio team or something like that. They're great. Um, it's also like it's it's one of those things where it's a little jarring because you can tell they're not an engine, but like they look so good, I don't care. And then it drops you into gameplay, and like the first thing you do is play as Clank, which is kind of strange in this kind of game. But it's a really good opening section because it shows the, the kind of renewed focus on Clank in the story. And it also shows how Nefarious fits back into everything. And like the new kind of time shifting mechanics that they're adding into the game. Like it's all very good. It's very strong. I'm hooked like right from the go. You also get a pretty good variety of weapons right off the start. You still have the, you know, the usuals of your, your pew pew gun and your, like, lobbing bomb type thing. Uh, but it's interesting because they made them uh, constructo versions. So you can actually go in, like, you get different mods as you go throughout the game. And you can actually go in and customize each uh, each element of the, the gun to suit your playstyle, so like they're all still fairly similar you know to what has been in past games but it at least makes those kind of generic weapons that are in every game somewhat unique which is a complaint i've had before so again it's nice that they're fixing that kind of thing and this is also the one where they made mr zircon a proper weapon and he's great the groovatron is also a proper weapon but i don't really use it much it's... i don't really like the groovatron i don't know Sorry. Um, it's also worth noting that I think in the last video I said that I was excited for this one because I hadn't played it. And I apparently did. I played quite a bit of it, actually. I have a feeling it was one of my games that got stolen. Um, because I don't currently own it. But, like, a good probably half of the game was very memorable to me. And I didn't realize, I guess, that, like, the sections I remembered were from this game. So, like... Specifically, the, the kite sections, you know, the way you are kind of like recording actions and setting multiple clanks out in a row to solve puzzles. Like, I remember that stuff very well. And then the new like ship combat exploration sections. I actually remember pretty fondly, like I kind of got tired of them by the end with this one. But once I got out into the world, I was like, oh yeah, this is actually kind of like an open map with like little side planetoids and stuff you can visit like it's pretty cool it's definitely the best of like the you know the ship combat sections at least um even if you are like moving just kind of on a horizontal plane which is a little weird you can like do barrel rolls and stuff to kind of you know move around a little bit in the 3d plane but for the most part you're just veering side to side forward and back and pretty much every enemy stays on the same plane as you but like it also kind of fixes some of the problems with like the camera and stuff so i mean you know the last game was pretty much like vertical only this one's horizontal only like they're two sides of the same coin they both work very well but i like these sections a little more because if you want you can just go planet to planet you don't really have to do the other stuff but like I actually really liked these little side planets. They kind of gave you like bite-sized platforming and combat sections outside of the, you know, normal planet objective stuff. And I mean, the the perks you get for them are pretty good. Like 
It's usually either zonies that you use to upgrade your ship. Um, again, only really matters if you're doing the ship section, so it makes sense that like most of the zonies you get are on those planets because you you know have to use the ship to get the ship upgrades. It's neat. Or like the constructor mods or uh, bolts, which I've never really cared about the bolts as far as like collectibles, um, just because they're really only used for like cheats and stuff. But the fact that they're optional means if you get tired of doing the ship stuff, you can just stop. <laughs> um, I basically got enough to where like I had all of the ship upgrades and then I quit. Like I didn't feel the need to get all of them. I guess there's like an optional final boss you can unlock if you get all the zonies, but meh, it's fine. Yeah, in general, like a few hours into the game, I was mostly impressed with like how much more confident and polished this one felt over the last one. Like, visually, it's a huge step up. It doesn't have that kind of dark, like, uh, more realistic tone to it. It's definitely a lot brighter, more colorful. They introduced Bloom. <laughs> this was, I guess, the, the generation of Bloom. Uh, if you remember from, like, a bunch of Wii games and stuff that everyone made fun of the Bloom. But, like, it works for this art style, I think. It's really good. While the graphics and everything are still fuzzy... Because, I mean, it is running at 720p on a 1080p monitor. It just looks more vibrant and, like, a more detailed version of the PS2 art style. So, like, it feels more like a generational jump. Whereas the last one I felt was very muted. Like, they were trying to do something different with it and it didn't work. This seems like they kind of figured out how to make the game look just better. Probably the most surprising thing about this game is all of the Clank stuff. Like, he gets full-on sections between basically every, like, solar system part or whatever. You do a section that's substantial as Clank. And as you go, he learns more of his, like, time-shifting abilities. He gets some, like, kind of genuine combat sections because he's got, like, a whole staff type thing now and you can like reflect attacks back at enemies and there's a lot more variety to that stuff and he even gets boss fights like this could have very easily been a standalone clank game and it still would have been a lot of fun but instead it's kind of just more like clank and ratchet am i right <laughs> ratchet feels like an afterthought sometimes because the clank stuff is really cool and the story is pretty much entirely revolving around him Aside from some of the tricky puzzle sections as Clank, though, seriously, some of those things are baffling on, on first try to figure out, like, what to record in what order. Um, but aside from that, it is notable how much easier this game feels. Um, I know in the past I complained about how annoying it was to have to redo a lot of these sections because of how sparse the checkpoints are, but this one kind of goes, like, too far in the opposite direction. I wouldn't say, I guess I shouldn't say too far, because, like, it's more so that it's, I'm, I'm noticing that even when you die, you don't get kit sent that far back. It's not super hard, because it doesn't have those frustrations, which is a good thing, don't get me wrong. But, like, it does feel a little bit too far in the other direction, because every time you die, you respawn with all of your life and all of your ammo back. So it's not like you just, you know, started a checkpoint where you left off. You actually, like, basically get to start over that much further ahead. So it does, I mean, it takes some of the challenge out of it, where, like, if you're having a hard time and you're about to die, just die, and you probably won't get sent that far back, but it's easier than, like, searching around for health and stuff. Um, I almost never ran out of ammo, except in some of the combat challenges, because there's not a lot of ammo for each of the weapons, and, like, you are swimming in bolts most of the time. So, like... Basically, as new weapons and armor upgrades and stuff become available, you can probably already afford them. They also drastically cut down on the six-axis stuff, but there is still a dumb six-axis controlled weapon. It's not nearly as offensive, but still don't like it. <laughs> it's just, like, it's still usable if you don't, you know, steer or whatever, unlike the stupid tornado weapon, but it's not my favorite weapon by any means. Also, so I guess it's, maybe it's just the PS3 engine, like, for these games, but the grind boot sections are still kind of bad. Uh, they're very... They're a lot more chaotic, like, visually, than they were in PS4, 
And the fixed camera angles means that you still, like, are very likely to just miss a gap. The more frequent checkpoints mean you probably will just restart exactly at the grind boot section, but it's still kind of annoying how they, like, they put things so close together that you're bound to miss. And speaking of locking the camera, because Ratchet basically uses the entire game without Clank, he gets these new uh, hover boot type things, f like, from the past game, but... This time you can just kind of free run with them. And they're really cool. Like, they have some great platforming functionality. But for some reason, whenever you activate, like, the speed boost mode, it locks your camera. So it kind of feels like in the, the first Ratchet & Clank game on PS2, where, you know, you didn't have the ability to strafe. Um, and so everything you did was, like, going in circles or whatever, like, trying to fight the camera. It kind of feels like that. No matter what direction you turn around... The camera doesn't move, and it's not great. But, again, it makes for some very fun platforming sections that combines, like, speed boost sections with swing boots onto, you know, grind rails. Like, it's very dynamic, and I love it. Also, I touched on it a bit earlier, but I love the story of this game. Like, maybe it's just the more cinematic way it's told, or maybe it's that it actually kind of, like, you know, validates past games, which a lot of them haven't. Because it really goes into the history of Ratchet and Clank and, like, rewrites some of their lore, sure, but also, you know, deepens that lore because they didn't really have consistent characterization or anything before now. Uh, so it's really weird that, like, Clank is the, like, secret offspring of this, like, ancient robot race type thing. And Ratchet is, like, not the last Lombax. Um, and you meet a character that, like, knew his dad, and so it's kind of like he has this, you know, this new father figure through the whole game that helps him try to find his family again. And I don't know, there's, there's some really cool things there, and it also, like, it ties in Nefarious and, um, Emperor Tachyon in really cool ways into that history. Like, you know, it explains the actual war between the Lombaxes and Emperor Tachyon's race, and how that tied into the extinction, I guess, of the Lombaxes. And then, like, Nefarious is trying to manipulate the Zoni to get some kind of, like, to get control of the Great Clock in order to, you know, ha like manipulate time to his will. It's great. There's a lot of really cool things there. And speaking of really cool things, they finally added the ability to quick switch gadgets on the D-pad. It's a little thing, but it's so good, because there's really only four main gadgets. The hover boots, the swing shot, the... I forget what it's called, but it's basically like a like a suction thing. You can like suck in water or uh, oil or, you know, different things and spit them onto various things. To, for It's an okay gadget. Like, it's, it's at least more all-encompassing than some of the past ones. And then the last gadget is a time manipulation thing that the game never has you use, but I'll get to that later. Um, but yeah, being able to especially quick switch with the hover boots is great. But that being said, like the rest of these games, it does start to kind of wear thin by the end. Uh, the story stays great, but there's a few uh, less than good like space combat sections and especially a few planets that are not up to snuff with the rest of them. Um, for example, there's a whole planet that's basically just, like, a huge, like, platforming combat encounter. It relies very heavily on, like, hover boot uh, platforming jumps in a way that feels like it should maybe just have, like, had, uh, like, a hover boot race on it or something. Because that's those still aren't a thing anymore. I miss hover boot races. But the way they, like, mix it with combat is really chunky. And then it's just, like... You just have a counter at the bottom, and you have to take down all of, like, the, the leaders of the resistance or <laughs> enemy resistance, whatever, whatever the group is. And then once you take all them out, a few more, like, big bads drop, and you have to take them out. Before and after that is some really bad sections where, like, you have to avoid these, these little munchy guys that will eat anything that they can get their hands on, and you don't have the gadget yet to, like, actually, you know, guide them to where they need to go, so you just have to, like, speed past them, 
and it's really bad. The the platforming and the the camera in this section is not. I don't really know how to explain it any further. You're seeing the footage. It's bad. <laughs> and once you get the gadget to actually like send them to where you want, it's still not a very good section. Um, you basically use this like nectar to direct them towards like wall or doors and stuff that they can chew on instead but they only do it for so long so you get in there and then they finish and run after you still so it's yeah that whole planet is just not fun to explore yeah the time travel stuff with ratchet is pretty simple but like i'm still a sucker for it <laughs> um it helps that it was like the planet after the one i hated like I said, I still don't remember the names of any of these planets. Just get used to that. But it's a really cool thing where, like, you have to jump back and forth between the uh, past and present. Like, making changes in the past that affect the present. In order to, like, basically bring the planet back to life. So you can gain access to the, like, inter inner sanctums or whatever. And just the way it plays into the story and stuff is really neat. Like I said, there's nothing crazy to it. You're basically just creating grind rails. <laughs> But it's the little thing sometimes, you know? And yeah, then they bring in the Valkyries, which have kind of shown up a few times. Um, but this game specifically, like, tried to make them a big deal in the story, but you never actually see them. And then suddenly you go to this planet where, like, you have to basically do uh, a bunch of different kind of combat uh, platforming challenges involving them. And, like, each one is kind of a separate, like, standalone, you know, quote-unquote boss battle. But, like, it has some cool puzzle mechanics to it, too. And then suddenly, seven hours in, after you finish all that stuff, you get reunited with Clank. Which I honestly didn't expect. I kind of assumed they were going to stay separate for this whole game. It's kind of weird, because, like, we're basically at the end of the game. But, you know, whatever. <laughs> Clank's cool, that's fine. But this is also when you get, like, the, uh, the time-slowing orb thing that he used in his solo sections. And... At least as far as, like, the mandatory stuff that you have to do for the rest of the game. It never forces you to use it, like, for a puzzle section or anything. I kind of assumed that would be, like, you know, every game has kind of had that end-of-game gadget. That, like, you really only use for the final planet or whatever. But no. I know that, like, you can go back and redo some parts uh, to get, like, you know, missed collectibles and things like that. So maybe it ties into those, but... It's just weird that you gain this late game power and clank and don't really need either of them. And he also briefly plays into the final fight, but like they didn't need to be brought back together for that. I don't know. The whole the whole end of this game feels a little rushed. I'll detail that a little bit more, but um, I kind of liked clank stuff more when he was alone. Like there was a pretty cool little like it's not a it's not a door unlock mini game, but it's kind of similar, like, there's a pretty cool little mini-game with Clank where you have to, like, destroy virus-type things around a planet in order to, like, stop the time manipulations that are happening on that planet. Um, and they basically gain you access to the next part of the Great Clock. And they're neat. They're quick, but they're neat. And they, like, you know, elevate in difficulty with every one you do so it never gets old. But yeah, I don't know. I, I liked that they were separate because it helped to split up the types of gameplay you were doing. Like, this game doesn't once have that just draining, like, combat gauntlet for, you know, a few hours. Like I said, there's that one planet that sucks, but, like, it's still got some variety to it because you're zipping around with the with the hover boots and stuff to get to each section where the combat is, rather than just, like, walking forward and finding more enemies. But every time you start to get tired of playing as Ratchet and doing the combat stuff, it switches over to Clank and does some different stuff. So, like... There's still a good variety there. Um, so once they're back together, it's like, all right, this is pretty standard Wreck and Clank stuff at this point. Also, the weapons never really, like, elevated to a great point by the end. Like, you get a good variety still, but the ammo is a little lacking. And there's so many of them that are, like, specific use that you end up just using the same ones over and over again that you've already upgraded all the way. And weirdly, like... They removed the kind of rare titanium mod upgrades from the last game. So it's just the five tier upgrade system again. So that's like a downgrade from the game that was arguably much worse than this one. Kind of strange. And the armor upgrades that you can usually get 
are locked to story beats. So basically every time like I went to an armor vendor and there was a new one available, I had more than enough money to buy it already. So I was just kind of like swimming in money, waiting for the next thing to become available. But yeah, the final part of the game, uh, there was some really cool time travel stuff in there still, but like once you got reunited with Clank, it felt pretty generic and it just kind of felt rushed to the end. And then you have what I thought was going to be a really bad final fight against Nefarious. Uh, and it was. Like, it was another, like, multi-stage thing with a, with kind of a platforming part in the middle. But that platforming part was really bad because it was hover boot related. And it was really easy to fail. But, like, unlike before where you have to restart the whole Nefarious fight, this just restarts you at the hover boot section. So it's just kind of this annoying, tedious, like, okay, maybe I can make the jump this time. And then you fight Nefarious again. Still kind of sucks. And it goes to a cutscene that is not the end of the game. <laughs> uh, so it turns out that your new father figure mentor, Azimuth, betrays you. Um, I'm, I wasn't entirely sure why it felt kind of out of left field, but it was still surprising. Like, it was a good twist. Uh, and then you have to fight him instead. And he is actually the final fight. It's a pretty good fight. So you actually use Clank to try to make your way to the Great Clock. And then you have to fight Azimuth, beat him, and save the Great Clock or whatever the end of the game is. I don't totally remember, honestly. Like I said, it's been a while since I beat the game. And they have some very heartfelt moments at the end where Clank realizes that he can't stay behind. He has to disappoint his father and continue traveling with Ratchet for some reason. <laughs> but it's good. Like... There, there's there's good story beats there. I've just forgotten some of the details by now. And it's nice the way both of them separately play into the final encounter. It's not like Ratchet's the only one that saves the day and Clank is just also there, you know? And I love that Clank has to use time travel specifically to save the day. Like, it's a, it's a silly little gimmick of like the, you can only go back six minutes, that's anything more is unsafe. And he's like, six minutes is all I need. And they go back, save the day, it's great. But I will say, like, this final fight against Azimuth was really the first time the game felt hard. Like, it's a challenging final fight, but the rest of it was so easy and, like, the checkpoints were so frequent that I never really struggled. It was just some things were a chore. And even the final fight, like, I think I lost at one point and it started me back at, like, his second phase. So I still didn't have to redo a lot. And there's still the issue of, like, you start back with, you know, all your health and all your ammo and stuff again. Um, I don't know how to find that happy medium between, like, you know, not making you redo substantial sections every time you die. And also, like, making it challenging enough that if you die, there's consequence. But they're struggling with that balance, too, I think. But that being said, this is definitely my favorite game in the series. And it's got me really excited for the next one because of how well the story was told and how engaging it was. But it also had its fair share of issues, just like all the other games. Um, I want to make sure it's clear that while I love these games, they're not perfect, and I wouldn't expect them to be. But I thought that while this game had a great balance of puzzle platforming and combat, with way less of those just tedious combat gauntlets on each planet, I still felt the game start to wear on me a bit by the end. It just teased so many things rather than going full on with them, so I kept wanting more than what I got, especially with kind of the limited time travel gimmicks of like, you go back in time just to drop a few seeds into planters and go back to the present and grind on the, the vines they create. Like, that's all you really do with the time travel stuff. It felt like a pretty safe way to use that concept. Plus, after you finally reunite with Clank at, like, the eight-hour mark, you get that last gadget to slow time, and you never have to actually use it. <laughs> Which is very weird. I just, I want to reiterate that it's very weird. It feels like there's missing content here that, like, you were supposed to use that with, and they just didn't put it in. <laughs> and I'm sure you can, like, use it as a utility in combat and stuff to slow down enemies, but... That doesn't feel like enough excuse. Like, I thought there was going to be maybe some kind of final planet gauntlet where you slow down platforms, jump back and forth in time, 
like really build to that time focused climax but all we got was a return to another planet we'd already been to to spend five seconds reaching nefarious and then a cutscene where clank turns time back six minutes again the cutscenes are great but after all of that open exploration on each world the ending felt rushed What's the point in issuing a gadget that you never have to use? The game's great, but that one thing just really bothered me and I can't get over it. But that being said, I could probably spend more time talking about this game, but I want to get this project over and move on to something else. So uh, yeah, I'm going to move on to the next game um, and hopefully it has some cool stuff also. I say that if, as, as if I haven't already started playing it. But I'm not very far, to be fair, so, like, it could still disappoint me. <laughs>
that one's a stinker, so it's <laughs> it doesn't matter. This is the first one that like really I I barely played any of. Okay, bear with me because a lot of my other notes on this game are kind of like in order of the game. Um, so I'm just kind of touching on like separate mechanics as we go. The increased focus on aiming in this game, like the way you jump from the, the way you jump around in the anti-grab spots and the way you like manipulate the portal gun. <laughs> what? It's not, it's a portal gun without the trademark. I don't remember what it's called, but yeah, the way you aim that, like the aiming is kind of slow and you do it a lot and you can't, uh, as far as I could tell, you couldn't adjust it in the controls. As much as the like portal gun gravity puzzles were a fun idea, and I'm I mean I'm always a sucker for that kind of thing, I didn't really enjoy a lot of them. They either boiled down to just creating a bridge for yourself from one point to another, or basically riding along the um, the beam I guess of the portal shooting one at another one, figuring out where else to connect it to, and then, like, transferring to that new one. They threw in a few curveballs with, like, death spots, but it was kind of a one-planet gimmick, and really the mechanic isn't that prevalent in the game anyway, so it's like, when I mean, that's the whole th kind of thing that this game is built on, and it's not that important and not that fun, it's a little strange. On the other hand, the new Clank sections are just exquisite. Just chef's kiss. Like, that is Gravity Puzzles done right. Um, it's a very simple concept of just shifting the direction of gravity and kind of a, you know, an enclosed space. But it's used so well. The way they're, they kind of introduce a few different mechanics throughout the whole thing. Um, there's a good portion of them. I, I wish there were a little bit more, like, later in the game. It kind of feels like the latter half is, like, a lot of combat. And they forget about the other mechanics that they'd introduced already. But, like, every time I get to do one, I get excited. So I just, I wanted more of them. Like, I could have taken a whole game that's just that system. Do, like, like Captain Toad. The way that started a Mario 3D world. And then became its own thing. Like, do that. And I've mentioned it a few times, so I gotta get back to it. The length of this game is lacking. <laughs> like, from the standpoint of this video, I'm fine that I was done with it in like five or six hours because like, I'm already getting close to the wire on getting this video out on time. Uh, so, you know, the fact that the last game I was rushing to complete wasn't that long, great for the project. But like, as a player, I feel like you don't have enough time to really flesh anything out. There's like five planets, I think, maybe four, four or five. And each one is like, it's meteor. Like there's a lot more variety of things you do as you travel the map and everything. And like, it, it, it feels like the level design is on point, but there's only five of them. They're about like an hour of like, just, you know, varied content on each one. And then you generally for each planet have to like, escape in some way so they just have you backtrack through the level again which is a little bit padding for time let's be honest i'm okay with a short you know tight game like i mean i love you know spider-man miles morales more than i did the original because it kind of trimmed the fat a little bit but with this case like it's it's basically the last game in the ratchet and clank series like the whole point of it was to tie up the stories that they had you know put out so far um, that's why, like, the story is so cool, because it kind of feels like a love letter to the history of the series, like, bringing all the elements back together in a way. And I think it was a budget title when it came out. I think it was, like, 40 bucks or something. Still, like, to end seven games on this, like, you know, half-duration game that, like, cut out a lot of the excess things feels a little weird. Like... Maybe, uh, maybe it was a budget title to try to get interest back into Ratchet & Clank. I don't know the history of it. I'm not Matt McMuscles. Maybe he'll do it what happened on it eventually. But yeah, the way that the planet activities are kind of structured, where, like, there's some really good front-loaded activities, but then there's some kind of escape and, like, a backtrack. 
And usually that part is very combat heavy to the point where there's like multiple enemies that come up like wave after wave with HP bars. <laughs> um, you know, it's not just the bosses this time. There's like a lot of bigger quote unquote enemies. Yeah, there it, it goes back to some of that like overdone combat gauntlet stuff that I was kind of happy to not have anymore. But, you know, that stuff pads time more than a lot more like cinematic story moments. Because as cool as the characters are, the story, like, the the plot, I guess, is a little lacking. Uh, it basically follows these, like I said, these twins that are trying to steal the old Dimensionator. And you have to stop these twins from opening up a dimension to their home world, I think. Like I said, it's not it's not super well told. So the, the whole thing is just another MacGuffin chase. Like, there's not a lot else to it. Um, there's really no arc for either Ratchet or Clank in this game because it's kind of just like an epilogue to the other games. Like, they shout out the Thugs for Lest group again, which hasn't been around since the beginning trilogy, I don't think. There's some end jokes of, like, not trusting Quark because remember that one time that you, like, tried to trick the whole galaxy? You know, there's there's that kind of thing that feels like fan service, but the story itself doesn't really have anywhere to go because the whole thing just kind of exists to, like, set the world at peace or whatever uh one last hurrah with our old pals ratchet and clank like but the characters are cool and like the only problem i have with it is they they bring the whole emotional arc uh to a head by killing kronk and zephyr so that you get mad at these villains because they murdered my least favorite characters from Tools of Destruction that slowed the whole game down. I mean, I guess, like, there's no weight to it because we don't really get to know anything about the villains, aside from the fact that they killed Ratchet's friends. And honestly, I didn't even remember them because they weren't in a crack in time. So they reintroduced them. They kind of, like... Aside from a few mentions to the Great Clock and stuff, they kind of act like a crack in time never happened. Which is a little weird, because that was so substantial to the story. This is kind of going more back to the, the Tools of Destruction stuff. Which is even weirder... I know, how, how many levels deep does this go? When you look at the box art and see that they dropped the future from the, the franchise. So, like, honestly, I thought maybe this was a sequel to, you know, the other games that weren't the future games. But no, it ties all of them together. So the branding was strange there. But it's still a fun ride, and I mean, it's a it's a very polished game. It's just short. So like there's still a lot to like about it. But the the part that frustrates me the most is like the coolest planet is also apparently the final one. <laughs> you go to the museum that houses the Dimensionator, and the whole museum is like this big puzzle section where you have to carry this dude around and he like activates information at each spot and he also like triggers doorways and platforms that you have to do some kind of frustrating platforming over and everything and then like the whole museum ends with just kind of a trip down memory lane with like dioramas of famous scenes from past games and then a statue room that basically immortalizes all of the past villains which is a choice <laughs> but this is also where the, w one of them I didn't recognize, and it was apparently the main bad guy from Ratchet Deadlocked. So they acknowledge Deadlocked as, like, official canon, but don't have ye old pirate from uh, Quest for Booty with a statue. So I think I, I put the wrong games in these videos, apparently. <laughs> I was told I should do Deadlocked, but meh. Combat's my least favorite part, come on. Um, but yeah, so that story is canon, apparently. Nothing from Size Matters either, but who cares. Anyway, all the main villains are there. It's great. It, there, there's some good, like, dialogue there, too. But yeah, then it's basically the end of the game. There's, like, another kind of little platforming puzzle section. That's okay. And then a multiple stage final boss, which... <sighs> the boss itself was dumb. Like, the creature that you have to fight. It just kind of feels like they did the, you know, the giant blue experiment again. Where it's like a weird fake out at the end and the final boss isn't actually the thing you expect it to be. But yeah, the final boss mechanics were pretty cool. Because 
they split up the fight between Ratchet and Clank. So the Ratchet part was pretty generic. Um, I actually found it kind of annoying because you're on a fairly small platform and so when you're strafing you can just fall off and then you have to start that whole phase of the fight over again. But mostly it was just kind of a generic bullet sponge. Um, I pretty much used all of my ammo like every you know round of the fight. So like it's fine. But the clank part is more of the you know the gravity shifting stuff and it's not the best version of that thing but like it's still cool that they worked it into the final fight and then there's also like between the phases you have to kind of do another ratchet chase it seems like that's the thing they do is just split up the phases of uh, final battle with a with a chase <laughs> but this one again it's fine um it's like one of the only times they bring back that gravity jump mechanic from the beginning of the game the final fight kind of took me by surprise because like the museum was cool and all but i <laughs> i actually like i looked up a walkthrough of the game to see how close i was to the end because i was kind of just i was i wasn't trying to cheat i was just like planning out when i would actually get this part of the video recorded and i found out that i was on the final planet like an hour away from the end not even like half an hour away from the end so it was a pretty easy one to beat, but good grief. <laughs> I did not realize that was the final planet. I don't, like, the game definitely didn't overstay its welcome. And like I said, I wouldn't say it was too short. I just felt like they introduced so many mechanics that barely played out. Like, you would go maybe two hours between times you would have to use something. And when a game is only like five hours, that's not a lot of time using that thing. <laughs> So yeah, well, this is still, you know, prime Ratchet and Clank. Like, it's not as good as a Kraken Time. That that's gonna be a hard one to beat. But I mean, it's it's solid top five in a seven game series. Still, it's fine. This is gonna be a weird analogy, but kind of the way I think of it is, it's like the Donkey Kong Country three of this series. So a lot of people make fun of me because I love Donkey Kong Country three, and I do. But it's very gimmick laden and I mean sometimes the gimmicks in those levels are used to make up for just okay level design and even when it's good level design you don't like you spend so much time dealing with the gimmicks that you don't really think about like the actual levels that you're in. So there's a few like good you know just solid platforming like classic Donkey Kong Country levels mixed into Donkey Kong Country 3, but everyone always remembers the same obnoxious gimmicky ones. So this game's kind of the same way. Like, nothing about it is worse than the other games. It's just... It feels like a compilation of gimmicks that don't, like, cohese? Co coalesce into a full product. And while you can still enjoy the gimmicks and have, you know, your favorite levels in it, just from a game development standpoint, you can tell that they were running out of ideas and just kind of threw some stuff out there and then slapped Ratchet into it. I think that's pretty clear by the fact that as far as, like, new gadgets and stuff are concerned, it's pretty much just that portal gun. Um, everything else is somehow retooled from past games. And even, like, the the amount of weapons in the game is fairly low. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't want to be too hard on this one, because it's not bad in any way. It just kind of feels like a rushed-out encore for a series that always knew how to innovate. And the innovations here are, like... <laughs> this is the fourth season of Community. It has all the makings of the other games but it feels like someone doing a fan fiction of past ratchet and clank games yeah that'll work yeah i like i said I'm, I'm running late getting this video out so i'm going to stop rambling about this game and get into the outro i mean i guess i'm already here right like i mean I just did it. Like, this is the outro. I'm magically, we went from the game into the outro. There, it's, It was seamless. You didn't even notice. I need to start writing scripts for these things. So this has been the PS3 era of Ratchet and Clank games. This is what I hope 
Rift Apart is more like this kind of more cinematic, like creative mess of mechanics all brought together to make something fun. To say that these games are classics like the PS2 originals, I don't know if I could. I think they're better, <laughs> but they all in some way kind of feel like they're aping what came before them rather than like innovating for the next generation, you know? The closest they get to something like truly new and like good is in A Crack in Time. It's not flawless, but like it's up there. It's the reason I bought this shirt because like it's dope. I don't really know what else to say about these games. Like, they don't... Them alone, like, don't get me super hyped for what's next. Because, like, where the series left off, I can see how they're going to tie that into Rift Apart. Like, it was all about, you know, alternate dimensions and tearing rifts in the fabric of reality and everything. Like, clearly the foundation of this game is built on whatever mess they left behind by messing with, you know, other dimensions. They foiled the plot, but, like, something's going down on the, you know, universal scale. There's no, you know, cliffhanger or anything leading into what a next game could be. Not that any of these games have had that. Gameplay-wise, I think they'll take more from the PS4 reboot. Like, that is solid Wretched and Clank. Like, honestly, I hadn't played these others in so long that I just remembered them being more like the PS4 game. And, I mean, there's chunks of all of them in that, but it's like a best of of the last seven games. So of course it's the best Ratchet and Clank game. But here's hoping this next one can be just another step above. I'm very excited and the next video you get from me will be a review of that game. So look forward to that. Um, until then, I gotta start editing this thing. So, uh, editor Justin is making, um, host? Just actor? What am I? What am I? <laughs> uh, yeah, I gotta go. Every second I see tick on this record screen is another second I'm not working on this video. So that's all I got for now. Um, I hope you're looking forward to the Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart review. Um, and then I might talk about the thing I'm doing next. If you do like this kind of like, you know, series retrospective thing from me, um, if you like mine just blurted thoughts with no order to them um let me know obviously but like i have plans to keep doing these so even if you don't let me know i'm probably gonna do more but you can have some input let's make this a dialogue you and me how do i end a ratchet and clank video um on the other hand the new clank sections are just exquisite just chef's kiss. What is what is this thing I just did? I can't I can't recreate. Like Captain Toad, you know the way that started in Mario Galaxy. Mario Galaxy. No, Mario Mario 3D World. The way that started in Mario 3D World, and then became its own thing. Like do that. Eight years later. Jeez. 2013. Yeah. Eight years later. Huh. Every day you feel a little bit older, don't you? <laughs>